The following is a presentation of VBR. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our study of God's Holy Word. Good day, friends. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with another program under the caption of the Christian and the Church. And as we bring this broadcast to you today, we trust it will be a benefit to your entire family. We're going to the third chapter of the Ephesian epistle, and we're going to talk about the eternal purpose of God. You know, we're aware of the fact that man sinned in the garden and was driven from the garden, as we have in Genesis. And then God began to unfold a marvelous plan that culminated in the coming of Jesus to this earth. And I was reading the other day in Philippians, the second chapter, as we we're preparing this series, and what you mentioned there, that Christ made himself of no reputation, he took upon him the form of a servant, and he was made in the likeness of man. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Then we understand that God highly exalted him. But in the eternal purpose of God, we have the marvelous picture given to us here in the third chapter of the Ephesian epistle about the great mystery that we referred to in one of the other broadcasts, how the Jew and Gentile could be brought together in one body. In verse 10 of this third chapter, Paul says, to the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And then the momentous 11th verse says, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. So here's a very strong argument in the scripture to prove to us that the church in the mind of God played a very definite part. Now this, of course, is found in the personal life of Jesus upon this earth. Because you recall in that famous 16th chapter of Matthew, after Peter had spoken up in verse 16 and said that Christ was the Son of the living God, then we're aware of the fact that Jesus made some very outstanding statements that have their repercussions, we might say, and their vibrations even in our life today. He said in a very definite way, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed us unto thee. And I wish to point out the fact that Christ was the Son of God, was revealed by the Holy Spirit to the Apostle Peter, and perhaps to the other apostles. And then he said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He said, I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom, and whatsoever thou shalt bind upon earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose upon earth shall be loosed in heaven. If you want to take notes on that, it's from the 16th chapter of Matthew, beginning with verse 16 and going through verse 19. Now, those four verses are outstanding because they show us the position relative to the fact that Christ is the Son of God, that we have the church. And I want to say again on the broadcast today, not trying to be hypercritical, but I believe that people are missing the, well, the proverbial boat, so to speak, in failing to recognize the part that the church plays in God's marvelous plan. Let's key in here in this third chapter for a little while on the broadcast today and noticing that there was a great mystery that Paul refers to as far back in, well, the third chapter of Ephesians is devoted to most of that thought. But I'm going to pick up the thread of thought again in the sixth verse of the third chapter of Ephesians. If you're following in your text, notice that he begins here with the Gentiles. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, now, keep in mind that's the body of Christ, which is the church, of which Jesus is the head, as we told you is taught in the first chapter of Ephesians, verses 22 and 23, as well as Colossians 1 and 18. So here's the plan of God. The mystery is that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Then Paul says, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of his power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Verse 9, And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. So you see, like we said at the outset of the broadcast, this thing had its beginning clear back, well, maybe even before the fall of man. But God had this marvelous plan in mind, and it was culminated, as we said, with the coming of Jesus and his death upon the cross. And then, of course, we brought out to you 
that Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. And the church being the spiritual body of Christ brought about a magnificent picture here before our mind in these words that when the angelic host looked down, referred to as the principalities and powers in heavenly places in verse 10, they saw in the church the spiritual body of Jesus Christ, the unveiling of this mystery. Now the prophets had some idea regarding this, and we're going to be giving you a series on the station uh, not too long from now under the caption of the power of the prophets. And we're going to point out that the prophets uh, knew something about this uh, mystery. Uh, they had some idea that there was going to be a bringing together of all people under one definite head, and they knew this was in the mind of God. And as was often true, the prophets wrote about those things, not knowing how they were going to be fulfilled. I think I might give you an illustration from everyday life that might explain how we understand this. Supposing in any community there was going to be a statue or a monument erected to some citizen or some event. Now, that's happened all over the country. Maybe those of you that listen to the broadcast today say, well, yes, I remember when a, a monument was erected in the community to a certain event. Maybe it was an outstanding accomplishment in the community. Maybe it was a catastrophe in the community. Or maybe there was some citizen who uh, all became an outstanding uh, individual in the community and there was a statue to be erected to him. I remember out to St. Joseph, Missouri, there is a statue of the Pony Express. And any of you that have been to that community know that this is in a very conspicuous place in that fine community. And people drive by then they say, well, there's the statue to the beginning of the Pony Express in St. Joseph, Missouri. But the point I'm trying to make is this, that people have some concept of what a statue is going to be like or a monument, but they don't really see the finished product until the day that it's unveiled. Now, I believe the prophets, as well as probably the angels referred to as the angelic hosts, principalities and powers in heavenly places, had some concept of what this was going to be. But they did not really know it was a mystery to them how God was going to bring this about. So if you think with me, with the death of Jesus upon the cross, in which he made it possible for all men, Jew and Gentile, now to have an opportunity of coming unto him, and he issued that wonderful invitation in Matthew 11, when he said in that famous 29th verse of that 11th chapter of Matthew, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now we're aware of the fact that Jesus associated with the Israelite people but it was God who so loved the world, a world in sin, that he gave his only begotten Son. So this implies that Jesus was given upon the cross as a sacrifice, as a propitiation, as an atonement for all men who truly would apply his blood spiritually to their life. And that simply conveys the idea of obeying the gospel, being immersed into Christ to rise to walk a new life. So the principalities and powers in heavenly places saw the eternal purpose of God here being unfolded, being unveiled, and no longer was it a mystery that the gospel was first to be preached to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. Paul made that clear in the first chapter of Romans, and I always think of that key passage when he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He said, it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So you know the story of the Bible, how that the gospel was preached first in Jerusalem. It affected the territory or the region of Judea. In the 8th chapter of Acts, there was a proclamation by Philip the Evangelist in the city of Samaria, where both men and women believed and were baptized, and where even Simon the sorcerer, who had been a user of black magic, believed the preaching of the word and was baptized into Christ. And then it was taken to the entire world. And Paul says that this mystery was unveiled to both Jew and Gentile, to the entire world, preached to every creature under heaven, as we have in Colossians 1.23. So what's this mean to us in the broadcast today? You know, I'm really challenging your thinking, friends, if you have any concept that it doesn't make any difference about the church. If there's anything in this series that I think is going to bring that out, is the Bible doesn't take that position. You see, if this were really true, that it didn't make any difference about the church, or if the Lord is just saying, well, one religious group is as good as another. He never did take that position. But you see, if, if that were true, then we'd have Scripture in the Bible for it. 
So when you advocate the idea, if you do, and I hope if you've been doing it, you'll think sincerely before you do it again, that truly it doesn't make any difference about the church. People say there's no link between salvation and the church, and yet the Bible says in Acts 2.47, the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved or were being saved. So you see, that is an erroneous teaching. Now, it may come from honest hearts, and we're certainly not saying that a person who holds that view is dishonest. Well, someone says, of course, the reason I have that view is because I know people and I know religious groups that uh, don't even believe the Bible. They don't even stand for the Word of God. Well, I understand that to be true, and that's a sad commentary. You know, I view this thing a little differently than uh, some people might view it. Uh, when there is some insidious thing that happens in religion, when someone has become a proverbial scallywag and has fleeced the people, uh, there are some people who just kind of smile and they seem to have a smug contentment that this is the way religion is. But I'm led to believe to some people, well, religion is religion. And to some people, church is church. But you see, when we begin to think about Jesus, we think about his body. And I am sure that if you have any concept at all of what the Bible teaches, if you have respect, and I'm sure you do for Jesus, that you're going to say that his body upon the cross was vital to our salvation. I believe you're also going to say that the body that he purchased, his spiritual body, which is the church, and Acts 20, 28 makes that as clear as any passage, it says that he purchased the church with his own blood. That's Acts 20 and 28. In this same Ephesian epistle, it says in Ephesians 5, 25, that he gave himself for the church. So you see, here's something to think about. And when you think about the Christian, and you think about the church, you're dealing with the eternal purpose of God. This is a purpose that God had in mind clear back there in the beginning. And isn't it a wonderful thing that Jesus did not make this arrangement as a human organization? He didn't make that arrangement at all. We're aware of the fact that God's the one who uh, made the arrangement not of human origin, but his son did give a human life upon the cross, but he purchased that spiritual body. So you see, if you're out of Christ Jesus today and you're contemplating obeying the gospel, be very sure that when you obey the gospel that you have done that, which will comply with the teaching of the New Testament. And when your sins are forgiven, the same Lord that forgives your sins will add you to the church. So again, I want to point out that in Ephesians 3.11, that it is according to the eternal purpose of God that by the church might be known the manifold wisdom of God. And naturally, when you think of the purpose of God and you think of what God has in mind as far as man is concerned, that's the salvation of his soul. You know, a brother said to me some time ago, and I thought it was a good thought, he said, you know, when you think about what God had in mind in bringing about the plan of salvation, you realize that he had man in mind and the salvation of his soul. And I am sure that the church that Jesus purchased would have this in mind. Now, I want to say without fear of contradiction on this point that we have a sad commentary in the world today where religious groups seem to be in about everything else other than the saving of souls. You know, we can say also without fear of contradiction that even though it might be an unwritten circumstance, there is just a very vivid social gospel. And uh, religious groups have been reduced to the denominator where they become hardly more than service organizations. Now, they may do a lot of good in the community. But you see, the church is a soul-saving arrangement. Every person who obeyed that gospel, we've told you, had his sins forgiven, the Lord added him to the church, such as should be saved or were being saved. And then we're to serve the Lord as members of his body, which is his church, throughout the days of our life upon this earth. So the purpose of God includes the Christian and the church. And if you want to know more about this subject, why don't you contact the congregation that's bringing you this broadcast. If we can talk to you personally, we'll be glad to do so. We're going to leave this with you on the broadcast today. We trust it's been a blessing to you. No doubt it's challenged your thinking. But consider the Word of God and obey the truth that is able to make you free. May God bless us all as we do His holy will.